and nobody knows them. Who plus is the God of that? <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yep, there we go. Um, nobody gets to meet them except for this event. So this is a way that everyone can get a little taste for the work of our jurors and their design philosophies, where they're coming from. Um, I want to thank all of you, you four, for coming tonight, for doing this program. I know it's a lot of work. I want to thank our friend, Dean Michelle Addington, who's game for this stuff, which we love. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight. I want to thank Gensler for hosting us in their beautiful office. You guys, it's a beautiful office, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, I want to thank the AIAS, so our UT School of Architecture student group has an art auction here. Please buy the art. Bid on the art. It's really great. We're happy to have them. And I want to thank our generous sponsor tonight, Architectural Engineers Collaborative. Thank you so much. Couldn't do it without you. So Architectural Engineers Collaborative is a great friend of AIA Austin and the design community. So we're grateful. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our Design Awards Chairs, Chris Gonzalez and Sylvia Isaguer. Welcome everyone uh, to the 2022 Jury Conversations event. Um, so my name is Chris Gonzalez. I'm the chair for the Design Awards Committee this year. Um, know that by being here, you guys are participating and making history with our first ever hybrid event. Um, and so we will be in person for the award celebration on May the 18th at the uh, Branch Park Pavilion. Um, so go and get your tickets at aiaustin.org. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for being here, um, <clears throat> to the jury, to our moderator, and to the public at large. Um, but I especially want to thank um, AI Austin staff, and our design awards committee for putting in all the hard work this year to make this program a huge success. So thank you everybody. Um, so I think these past couple of years have shown us that uh, now more than ever, the design profession needs to take its place and use our unique skill set to uh, reshape this new um, world that we're starting to come out into. Um, so we need to com continue to serve our community and um, address today's problems with bold new solutions. So I have no doubt that um, our design community is already making strides with that and our wonderful jury will see that in some of the work that they review tomorrow. Um, so thanks for joining us <clears throat> to review this year's submissions with a fresh new perspective and exceptional group of jurors and to continue to celebrate design excellence here in Austin. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sylvia Isaguira, our Design Awards Committee Chair-elect. Hello, I'm Sylvia Isaguira, Chair-elect of our Awards Committee, and I am very excited to welcome everyone to our gathering. I've been participating in the Awards Committee for three years now, and I can easily say that jury conversation is my favorite part of the program. It's dedicated to celebrating design excellence in Austin. For anyone who is curious about what makes a design excellent, this evening presents a unique opportunity to engage in conversation with a diverse group of celebrated jurors from across the country. For me, this is one of the most meaningful conversations to be had. And the fact that this event is open to the public makes it even more significant for everyone driven by or simply interested in learning what drives design excellence. Thank you all for joining us. And I look forward to learning more about who our jurors are, how they approach design and what it is that they will be looking for in this year's entries. Although we helped select you guys, <laughs> we look forward to listening to your lectures. So yeah, let's introduce um, our jurors and our moderator. So we'll start with uh, Niraj Bhatia is a licensed architect and urban designer whose work resides at the intersection of politics and architecture. 
Niraj is the founder of The Open Workshop, a transcalar design research office examining the negotiation between architecture, territory, and collectivity. Niraj is the recipient of the Architectural League Young Architects Prize, the Emerging Leaders Award for Design Excellence, and the Canadian Prix de Rome. He is an associate professor at the California College of the Arts, where he also directs the Urbanism Research Lab, the Urban Works Agency. Bhatia has also held teaching positions at UC Berkeley, UT Arlington, Cornell University, Rice University, and the University of Toronto. He is co-editor and the author of several books. Niraj has a master's degree in architecture and urbanism from MIT, where he studied on a Fulbright Fellowship and a Bachelor of Environmental Studies and Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Waterloo. Welcome, Niraj. And all of you, I just want to let you know, there's like 30 people in this room. You can't see them, but they're over there. Everyone, even those in the <laughs> nosebleed seats. <laughs> yeah. oh. Uh, Dominique Davidson, AIA established Draw Architecture plus Urban Design in 2005 to explore the intersection between research, resource, resourcefulness, and simple clean forms. Her award-winning practice is a recognized leader in sustainability and named firm of the year by the American Institute of Architects, Kansas City chapter in 2014. Dominique's commitment to vibrant communities is exemplified by her role as a founding member for Women in Design Kansas City and the Ecological Urbanism Series and her service on Kansas City's Environmental Management Commission's Vacant Lot Task Force. She has also taught design studios at the University of Kansas and the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Since 2013, Dominique has been leading the development efforts for Plan IT Impact. This web application tool allows architects and planners to understand resource impacts at the earliest stages of the design process, linking open data with the development location. Plan IT Impact provides visually immersive feedback related to water, energy, CO2, transportation, and potential ROI. Before relocating to Kansas City, Dominique honed her design skills in the offices of Pelly, Clark Pelly in New Haven, after earning her Master of Architecture at the Yale School of Architecture. She received a Bachelor of Art in Architecture from UC Berkeley. And Ingrid tells me Dominique was also in a punk rock band. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right. Um, William Letty, FAIA, is a founding principal of San Francisco-based Letty Madam Stacy Architects, the 2017 recipient of the National AIA Firm Award. For over 30 years, he has been a national leader in the design of environments that celebrate our place in the natural world. LMSA has received more than 150 regional, national, and international design awards, and is one of only three firms in the nation to have received 10 or more National AIA Committee on the Environment Top 10 Green Awards Project Awards, the Institute's highest award for ecological design. Letty has lectured widely and served as a visiting professor at the Southern California Institute of Architecture and the California College of the Arts as the Howard A. Friedman Visiting Professor at the University of California, Berkeley and the Pietro Belushi Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Oregon. A past chair of the National AIA Committee on the Environment, he currently serves as the AIA California Vice President for Climate Action and Chair of the AIA California Committee, Committee on the Environment. And Mariana Martins graduated with a master's in architecture from Lisbon's Facultad de Arquitectura of Universidad de Lisboa in 2013. She has worked in Uruguay and another studio in Mexico prior to entering Tatiana Bilbao Studio. She has had the opportunity to work in projects from small domestic scale to public urban design and has developed most of these projects from the conceptual phase to construction documentation and site supervision. She has worked on a variety of programs such as housing, student <coughs> community residences, hotels, restaurants, cultural centers, and museums. She is currently working as a project coordinator for the renovation and extension of the Mexican American Cultural Center here in Austin. And lastly, uh, we want to welcome Dean Michelle Addington for being here and joining us as our moderator. Um, 
Well, Dean Addington is a great friend to AIA Austin, and she may need no introduction. Um, her bio is so impressive that uh, we just want to go ahead and share it. <laughs> so before coming to UT, she served as Gerald Hines Chair in Sustainable Architecture Design at Yale and was jointly appointed as professor at the Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Prior to Yale, she taught at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, the Technical University of Munich, Temple University, and Philadelphia University. Originally educated as a mechanical nuclear engineer, she worked for several years as an engineer at NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center, and EI DuPont at De Nemours, sorry about that, before she studied architecture. Her books, chapters, essays, journals, papers, and articles address topics ranging from fluid mechanics to the history of technology to smart materials. And she has consulted on projects as diverse as the Sistine Chapel and Amazon Rain and the Amazon Rainforest. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it, it, it breaks my heart that I'm not in the same room with you all, but I, I'm hoping uh, to see you if you come for the, the award ceremony and have that chance to talk to you in person. Um, you know, for all of us who've sat on juries and, 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 and for you, you know, there's something that, that's hard to explain to those who haven't had that opportunity uh, that it's not just a service that we do, um, but it's part of, you know, part of our joy. It's part of our education. It's this amazing opportunity to discuss your ideas, to test your ideas, uh, to share with others, to learn from the projects that you see. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that, that I shouldn't share this out loud. Um, you could, I could, I would pay you to let me sit on a jury um, that, that, that cannot leave this room uh, because I, I, I enjoy it so much. And I know that you're participating because you, you derive that same kind of joy and pleasure of seeing who's doing what, what people are thinking about. So I have a series of questions for you and I'm going to start with the easiest one first. I'm just gonna let you know that they're gonna get a little bit more intense as we go through this. Uh, so you might want a glass of wine or two. Or if you were here with us, it'd be mezcal or tequila. Just, just, just kind of priming to pump for when you come, come to visit us. Uh, but the first question uh, has to do with, you know, how a jury even begins to sort of engage with looking at a particular uh, suite of projects, of looking at an oeuvre of, of its particular time. You know, so, so many of you, so many of us have particular lenses by which we examine work. Uh, there might be lenses that say, this belongs as something we should talk about. This one, it, this part is something that maybe this is not the right time. Maybe this is not bringing forward the right questions. Uh, but, you know, it, admit it. We, we all have those lenses where we look and we might be, it might be the affirmative where we're looking for something in particular that, that really resonates with the way that we might view architecture or the needs of architectural practice, uh, but it also might resonate in different ways. And, you know, I've sat on enough of these that, and, and with en enough people the same uh, that I've been on, uh, on juries with uh, multiple times, that I know that we almost always start with that lens, even if by the time we're through with that process, we might have moved in a different direction. Could, could each of you share one aspect or one sort of key framing that's sort of very important for you as you begin to look at projects that you're considering for award? Uh, why don't, let me, let, I'm gonna to try to be random on this. Uh, uh, let's start with uh, Mariana. <laughs> or a volunteer. Hi. <laughs> okay, I can volunteer. Hi everyone, thank you for the opportunity. And I feel a bit humble next to people who have so many awards and uh, big careers. And I hope I can make my best, uh, give my best next to you. But I think overall uh, in the office, what we do um, well and what I've tried to do 
while thinking of awards is trying to think about how the project uh, gains and transcends architecture. I've tried to con concentrate more on, on other dimensions rather than making something beautiful or making something that I would like to live on and try to focus more on, on hum human values and what projects are giving to communities and what's happening to the city by doing this way a project or the other way, like what impacts. And I feel like cities are mostly beginning to be unlivable uh, for so many of us that I guess some of the projects I've been putting ideas on, on why should we give the, those awards are projects that are maybe more focused on that and, and looking at things differently and not concentrating so much on the lead scoring and how many points do I get by putting this type of glass and more like, um, what am I creating with the street or how is this affordable? How can a family of four live here? How could I live in this neighborhood? Um, how many years did, would I need to work to buy this house? So I think that was kind of my uh, perspective um, on it. Thank you. Thank you. That's actually going to lead to my next question, but let me, let me okay. hold on for that. <laughs> okay. Um, how about William? You know, I I think you're you're exactly right about uh, the jury experience. I've, I've I've also I think as probably many of us have said on my share, and and I always find them to be really uh, kind of rejuvenating uh, to share ideas and to to uh, uh, to try to find common ground on on what excellence really is. And I think that uh, and especially now, as as was pointed out, you know, in our current you know situation with the world changing as quickly as it is. Um, so I, I think the, the, the way that I've seen it happen before and um, uh, is, that, is that there's, a, there's often um, a, you know, a surprising commonality about what people sort of respond to um, as design excellence um, when at first view, and then I think it requires a more deeper dis, uh, dive into exactly why this thing is the way it is. Um, and many of the juries I've, I've been on, uh, you know, there's there's a fairly narrow range of schemes or, or projects that people kind of are attracted to, but there's always the outliers that get introduced because someone is a very passionate, one of the jurors is a very passionate um, advocate for that scheme and, and convinces the other jurors uh, to, to go along with them. So I really love that, that, um, that give and take that happens uh, in, a, in a jury and the sort of sharing of ideas and the, and the, the, um, the cajoling and, and convincing back and forth about what good design really is. So I'm looking forward to that very much. And, and I think that the projects that we're reviewing uh, really do um, present that nice range of, of, uh, a possibility. All right, um, Dominique. Um, yeah, it's, it is really um, an interesting experience. I, I also sat on the Chicago AIA Awards um, last year and uh, for interiors, which was a little bit different. And um, just seeing um, the variety of projects, you know, coming out of Chicago and now Austin and, and sort of just what's going on. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see that then um, with the new requirements or the fairly new requirements for design excellence and sustainability integrated. Um, I think that provides a much better um, kind of rubric uh, to, to have discussion um, and it's been really helpful. So I'm grateful to the AIA for, for bringing that kind of um, aspect to the awards forward. Um, I would mirror a bit what uh, Mariana said in terms of um, thinking about uh, other things than maybe just the kind of aesthetics and the craft, although I've been blown away by that um, in what I've seen so far um, in in your submissions. Um, 
but yeah, those other aspects too of the, you know, what are the socioeconomic factors uh, maybe at play? Um, of course, the, the sustainability piece, um, affordability, all of those things that Mariana mentioned, I think are they're key to what we do at our office and um, how we define positive impact of design. So that kind of becomes our, my lens, yeah. All right, Naraj. Hey everyone, um, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, it's great to be amongst you as close as we can be. Um, and it's great to see some familiar faces. Um, I, I would just echo you know, what's been said. First of all, there was an amazing series of projects to review. It was really pleasurable to go through it. And uh, you know, especially the houses, because you never get to get inside or see some of these projects. Many of them are not even on offices websites. And uh, it was really great to kind of, <laughs> I felt like I was sneaking in on open houses uh, <laughs> for various projects. Um, for me, you know, what I was really looking at was that obviously many of these projects dealt with a range of constraints from, you know, budget to site constraints, zoning or policy constraints. Uh, but the ones that really stood out to me are the ones that uh, dealt with all those constraints in smart ways, but also held on to their conceptual clarity throughout it all. And I think that was, that's always kind of for me an act of where is the designer enacting judgment? What type of constraints are they using to their advantage? And how are they um, seeing these things not as constraints in the end, but as opportunities? Um, I was, I, you know, I, I must admit, I struggled a little bit reviewing some of the projects, especially in the residential category, because they were all so beautiful. <laughs> they were all so amazing. And, um, and I, I found myself looking more and more to the price per square foot of all things, you know, how do we compare a project that's been done at $175 a square foot and one that's been done at $700 a square foot or one that's on a really sprawling, <laughs> you know, a state versus one that's you know on an urban site which might have more uh, kind of constraints coming from the site itself and, and I found that as a lens that um, helped me kind of say even the playing field because I think as as a designer and I'm sure everyone on this jury and in these rooms can relate the budget dictates a lot <laughs> of how what you know from day one what you can do and how you might enact that and the quality of craft and details and uh, in some cases, and I would say, and actually in many cases, the projects with lower budgets, I found uh, were forced to be very creative and innovative in how they use that money. And in some ways it helped sometimes isolate what was really important to the project by in some ways uh, editing out the noise. So it wasn't that all the you know, projects with lavish budgets stood out, um, but in fact, sometimes uh, they got lost because there was just maybe too many options on the table and there wasn't enough editing that had to be done. But I found this kind of question of economics and how architects create value for others that's extracted from buildings is something that, you know, as a discipline and as a jury, you know, we need to discuss. Yeah, I think these are, these are, are, are great points um, for us to think about and, and to lead into what might be one of the more difficult questions um, uh, to deal with that, you know, as we look at what's been happening in our world uh, and, uh, you know, and I think that it, it's not, um, not overstating to say a world where many of the, the structures that we thought of as enduring are, are crumbling or in disarray. Uh, where, you know, we saw the most recent IPCC report uh, that has us um, uh, not just heading uh, toward irreversible uh, climate change and the impacts of climate change, but barreling in that direction, uh, where we see unprecedented uh, inequities in, in society, economic inequities in society, but, but uh, as well as access to many things. Uh, where the very act of, of, uh, of uh, stepping out in public uh, can put, put someone under threat, whether it was the threat that we've, we've had for two years from the pandemic or the threat for certain aspects of, of society in terms of, of uh, let's just say the, the, uh, a, an erosion of civility 
uh, mm -hmm. that, that's taking place out there. We, you know, we, we are in a world that it's hard for us not to see what's been changing around us. Uh, and I mean, I hate doing this in front of students, uh, but, but we actually do look at, at students and we do look at our field, the field of architecture, uh, the field of design as a field that has enormous responsibility uh, for public space uh, and, and, and actually has, has an opportunity to have a true voice in this area. But as we're dealing with this, what we've noticed, and I was chatting with uh, several other deans of, of other, other universities, we've all noticed that um, our, our student body uh, may be leading a lot in, in sort of like asking some of these questions. They, they may be leading from the standpoint that if you ask a typical student who is graduating 10 years ago what was important to them, they you know, would have said, um, I want to be in um, a small firm. I want to work on projects like this. I might want to get some experience in a large firm, but it was very, very much directed toward what they thought their professional life was going to be like. Now, when you ask students, it's very much something uh, on the order of, I want to do something for the community. Um, I, I want to help uh, those uh, who aren't able to, to find housing. Uh, you know, find a way to, to get that. It, it's, it's thinking not about themselves, but about what their impact might be. And so as we think about these processes, it's processes of awards, uh, which are very important in our field. Um, what are you seeing that is changing in the way that, that, not only changing in the way that we need to think about awards, but also changing in the projects that you're starting to see? Are we seeing this percolate through the kind of work um, that's being produced or is that work still lagging? What we think we should be addressing in, in our arena. And just let you know, this is the, the toughest question I'm gonna ask. It's gonna go back to being, uh, go back to being a little bit easier. And around uh, free for all. Yeah. <laughs> I can I can jump take a jump at that. I, I do think you're exactly right. Of course, that you know architects um, I think are in a unique position. I think I tell students all the time that that um, you know given the challenges that our society faces around the climate emergency, around equity and justice, around all affordability, around all of these things, uh, there's never been a more exciting time in the history of architecture to be an architect because we have challenges that are that seem overwhelming, but we also have um, enormous ability and, and expertise in coming up with creative solutions. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, at our firm, I think we're really all about what we call uh, designing beyond the property lines um, that, you know, it's sort of similar to a little bit similar to what Mariano was talking about, that, that the projects that I'm drawn to um, are ones that have a bigger story to tell or a bigger lesson to, to provide than just being a really nice house. Now, we all know that doing a really nice house is hard enough by itself, but I would argue that that's not enough anymore. Um, we need to find a way to provide an affordable house that is also zero carbon, that is also something that can be replicable um, you know, across the country in a variety of different um, uh, climates. Um, we need to provide. We need to be thinking about at the at the at the, at the civic scale and the and the uh, community scale. We need to be thinking about buildings that welcome everybody that don't that don't exclude anyone. Um, you know, we need to be thinking more broadly about all those issues. Um, we need to embrace um, adaptive reuse. I'm, I'm I'm drawn to some of the adaptive reuse projects for this reason because, of course, the most sustainable building out there is the one that's already been built and. Um, uh, so I think the idea of, of, of creative adaptive reuse uh, also gives us an opportunity to have dialogues with history. And so we talk a lot about the idea of, of harvesting the embodied uh, carbon, but also the embodied culture of existing buildings and value of that um, to our, our society and, and to, the, to the planet. So I, I, I do think, I'm glad you brought this up, because I do think it's, it's that, that there are new criteria that are being applied whether we might be conscious of it or not to, to, uh, to these design awards programs. But I think there's also, we're seeing more and more projects uh, to your point that are 
that are more um, um, fluent in talking about some of these ideas. But you know, at the same time, it's still surprising how many projects ignore them completely. So, um, so that's the that's the interesting um, aspect of this. One thing that's been really interesting um, that we're seeing just over the last year, um, I think we've seen um, a lot of conversation around Black Lives Matter um, in in our community and of course, you know, nationally, but um, the ULI and um, AIA and, and other organizations have been really taking that seriously um, as a civic kind of um, duty to think about it. And um, we've been talking quite a bit in our office around this idea of, okay, we are actually part of a, um, a wealth generation machine, right? As architects, we're, we're creating pieces of property that have equity, that have real financial implications to them um, that have historically been benefiting a very small percentage of people. And it's been really interesting to see the conversations um, lead to educational programs of trying to get a more diverse group of, de of developers and people um, with agency to actually start having equity, right? Um, so real estate equity equaling social equity in a very real way. Um, and, and as a result, we've seen our client base grow much more diverse. So not only, you know, it's important for us to have a diverse group of um, designers in our office, but even more important is that the client base is, right? And, and the folks who are making the investment are getting opportunities to make investment uh, in our communities. So that, that's been incredibly um, exciting and positive um, in the face of, at the same time, uh, an industry that is on the other end seeing the loss of agency of architects and, and you know, design build becoming more prominent and, and um, some not so good news as well. But I feel like um, we try to focus on the, the smaller scale development and those, those um, places where we see rays of hope. Yeah, um, just to add a couple thoughts. Um, I think Michelle, your characterization the last few years is is spot on. I think COVID has really propelled uh, the reality that we live in a risk society. And, and I think, I, you know, I don't think it was ever stable. I think if you ask people that are oppressed, <laughs> or if we ask the natural environment, you know, these were never, you know, the crisis didn't emerge. <laughs> it's, you know, something that maybe we opened our eyes to in the last couple of years, as we realize every decision we make is some level of risk assessment um, in the world. And I think for me, it brings up this question about the role of the discipline, a discipline that has been traditionally um, rooted in producing stability and permanence now has to confront indeterminacy, contingencies, uh, a future that is uh, less stable for us to understand how to program even. And, and I think that fundamentally requires different mechanisms and models for teaching, uh, new ways of thinking about practice, relationships between clients, and, and the building, of course, being one of those. And, and I think you know, I imagine in 10 years from now, or my hope is in 10 years from now, in a, in a jury like this, we would both learn about the building as an artifact and the kind of beautiful photos, but also much more about the office, the team, uh, the relationships that were formed, the community engagement, all that stuff that is not seen that really, I think, uh, creates um, a different way of working that, you know, some of the innovation in many of these projects might not be in the actual aesthetics or the building form but actually in that front end stuff that we don't see. On the other hand, I am curious, and maybe one thing I was looking for in some of the projects that really talked about embracing indeterminacy or questions of evolution, transformation, is how did that change uh, ideas about architectural organization, architectural language, aesthetics, or did it not? You know, Was it still a modernist box that just happened to have really high-tech HVAC systems and things like that, but there were still, say, um, 
you know, uh, an idea of holding on to a particular aesthetic mandate, despite, you know, very different inputs coming into it. And, and I think this is where we're at as a discipline where we kind of are almost, um, you know, our, our predecessors hover above us. <laughs> and I think we're at a really interesting point where new architectural languages and ideas are, you know, going to emerge in the next 10 years. And, and we probably We'll, we don't have a terminology for it right now, but I think we'll finally kind of exit the modernist uh, dogma. Yes, uh, just one final thought, uh, since we're looking at, well, not really looking at, but having a student's crowd here, this idea um, that you were just saying about how the, the profession is seen and how it was seen uh, when I studied, I also had those ideas about the profession, about being it's a, about, about being a privileged profession and an art making one and uh, doing beautiful things and how it shifted um, when experience advances and what's happening in the world right now. You see that it's more of a duty and a responsibility to do something that we know will stay on and buildings will live on and being aware that it's also not an individualist profession and uh, one that tries to leave our name in buildings, but more about having a conscience that if I say no, if we say no to a project that is damaging a natural landscape or a context in which you shouldn't do a tower and all of those questions that you wonder when the project comes to your door. And if you say no, then maybe someone, the next studio might say yes. And, I think that's a, a call out to an urging collaboration in, inside the profession. I know if this is the reality in the US because our office is based in Mexico City, but collaboration has been a huge point of Mexican architecture the latest, the latest years, at least the years I've spent here. And I think as being united and understanding architecture as a, a collaboration process with so many more people than just architects and the communities and engineers and all of the consultants and all of that is, um, uh, I think, urging today to make all of these efforts to towards a better life and world that we're talking about, having less our names on the wall and more our goals united. And I think that that's kind of what I wanted to say for the students. I mean, this is amazing. And, uh, and I'm just thinking now that uh, if only we could have a few weeks to keep talking uh, on all of this, uh, I'm totally game for it. Uh, and, and we need to, and, and it's, not, it's, not, it's not something that ends in a few weeks. Is something that we just start uh, in, in, a, in a few weeks because these are all sort of observations and questions uh, that, that we need to be dealing with, uh, with within our field. And you know, each each decision is, that is made by uh, you know by an architect, uh, whether it's a, a decision about uh, a line that 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 is in a drawing. First decision about one, what one chooses to to focus on, or wrestling with these these much larger issues, and I think the sort of balance that's come up is not necessarily a balance, but what we might consider almost a binary that's come up between uh, that which endures, that that part of this profession that endures, and that which is in this sort of state of indeterminacy, that, that the, the, the state of transiency. Uh, and and we, we tend to chase after the transiency, uh, but sometimes we cling too long to that which endures or, or that which we think endures on that. And so it's really beginning to understand how, you know, we understand what is con contingent and what is constituent in, in the things that we do because we have to address both. We, we don't get to, to choose on that. But coming back to something that is more enduring, you know, the, the beauty about the profession and, and it's why, you know, we love it the way that we love it and, and we'll love it until the day we die. And it's not just because we don't earn enough that we have to keep working uh, until, until uh, we die, but, but we, we, we have this great love for this. And, you know, part of it is that you know we're dealing with several thousand years 
of you know the footprint uh, and the traces of decisions made uh, uh, for, from those who've come behind us and, and what we have that remains of, 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 of their memory will be the built the, you know the, the vestiges whether it's a, the vestiges of the built environment or parts of the built environment and sometimes the vestiges appear and, and simply uh, modes of organization or transportation that are left behind, even if we don't have the physical remnants, but, but the impact will be there. So we have this aspect about our field uh, that is truly enduring. So you have that from a sort of one, one way of thinking about it. And so when, when you're on a jury and, and you're looking at projects and you're thinking about projects, you know, just as I asked, uh, what was the framing for it? What is that thing that you always go back to? What, what, is, what is that aspect that you are drawn to, you know, every time that sort of connects with you as to this fundamentally is why we do what we do. This is why we love what it is that we do. And, and it's manifested here in this project. He struck them down. <laughs> Stunned in the silence. <laughs> this one was harder than the previous one. <laughs> <laughs> but friendlier, but less pessimistic. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe just to try with a naive <laughs> response to get, get us going. Um, I think um, at least when I was looking at the projects, um, it's so easy to evaluate in terms of where our current contemporary aesthetic styles are and material choices. And I was looking a lot about the relationships that are established and set up that will go beyond that. You know, in five, 10 years from now, maybe we won't like that particular material anymore. We've seen too much of it or that particular roof geometry or whatnot, but what type of social and environmental relationships have been established and, and those will endure uh, regardless of, you know, the actual kind of aesthetic, stylistic uh, components. And those relationships manifest in maybe programmatic organization, sometimes in the choice of structural systems and how those structural systems can be uh, allow for possibilities in the future that can't be anticipated. And, and I think that's a really interesting game that many architects are playing right now is really trying to say, where's our agency and what are the elements that we can at least set up as a framework to endure uh, despite not knowing all of the unanticipated things that might come in that framework while still establishing certain relationships that will hopefully hold true uh, through those you know, changes in society, economics and so forth. Now I'll I pass would, it to my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I, I have a simple question, uh, answer to this one, which is I have one last checkpoint when I'm looking at something and I can't decide if I like it or not. I say, does it look like it was already there before it was built? And sometimes when the answer is yes, then when I look at a plan, it looks like, yeah, it was already there. We didn't build it. So it's, it tells me that it's in, uh, in a kind of symbiosis with the environment. So I, I trust that feeling. And if it looks too forced, then I usually don't like it. <laughs> and I guess that's like the, my parameter to see, to decide ultimately. To me, I think it goes to what was said before about the conceptual clarity. Um, is, is there something there that's really compelling to me? Um, and I think, uh, you know, and, and, and how has that concept carried through then down to the detailing? Um, that, that is always interesting to see. Um, and, and there's certain projects that have a, um, a kind of, a, yeah, a, a holisticness to them, right? Where they just sort of come together um, into one, one creative move. Um, and, and that's always really great to see when that happens. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, uh, timeless buildings are ones that, you know, rise authentically from 
the site and circumstance and the kind of available technologies um, that are there. And so um, I, I too, I mean, I guess this is some of the residual. <laughs> We're never completely free of our four, forefathers and mothers <clears throat> uh, in the modernist movement. I think the idea of having strong a strong conceptual basis, a simple, elegant solution that that simultaneously addresses a multitude of of, uh, of factors. Uh, those are things that um, that I think one's after a while one just senses from a building um, uh, upon first first uh, viewing, and then and then and then hopefully uh, stands up to to deeper um, investigation. Um, so I, I, I think I think that's 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 always going to be the case. And I think what we're seeing now is we're we're calling up upon more and uh, buildings to do more and more. Um, you know, we're calling upon them to not just be beautiful, to not just be elegant and and timeless. We're calling upon them to lead the way to to a resilient future as well. And and uh, I, I really think that's exciting. I think it's an exciting challenge to think about buildings. And this is actually particularly where adaptive reuse is appealing because because you you start thinking about how how um, the building starts to have a dialogue with the past, the present, and the future all at the same time, and um, and I think that's something that can be very powerful to experience, but also very um, uh, very timeless and and uh, and useful um, over time. Okay, I have one last question, um, Austin. Uh, you know, and this is this is a quick one for you to, to sort of think, you know, off the top of your head, your 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 thoughts about it. Fastest growing city in the United States um, has had the highest, I believe, it was the highest uh, rate of price increase in housing, uh, and both I think in, in rent as as well as in purchasing in the last year. Or I think Boise, Idaho, was number one. I think we were number two uh, on that. Um, we, we are seeing five over ones take over huge swaths of the city. Uh, we are also looking at an unprecedented, uh, not necessarily unprecedented, but um, an unprecedented rate at which droughts um, uh, are, are repeating. Um, and we're, we're seeing a growth that, that doesn't quite match at all. Well, it doesn't match at all with our water situation that we have, but it's a growth occurring uh, throughout central Texas. Um, you know, it's, but it's also a, a, a place of unbelievable dynamism. Uh, it, it's a place that's both authentic and then just like, uh, you know, and then also uh, emblematic of, of the tech culture. There's so many things that, that, that come together here. What are what is what is your what are your impressions of Austin or your thoughts from these projects that sort of speak of something that might be unique to Austin? There definitely seemed to be a language across the residential projects that were very much Austin. Um, I I found. Um, some of the smaller scale commercial projects, I think had a, a lot of that local flavor too. Um, sorry, there's sirens in the background here. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, there were aspects of them that didn't feel that different than let's say Chicago's or Kansas City's, right? Um, so it was, it was, there was definitely a range, I'd say, from what I saw. Um, and in terms of the water aspect, um, yeah, we have a very similar situation in Kansas City. We're ranked like number five in terms of vulnerability for climate change because of drought. And uh, that's becoming a bigger and bigger um, focus for, for our community. Um, luckily, there are some good solutions, you know, for, for art for projects in terms of, of that. Um, so it's good to see people thinking about that with a lot more seriousness.
I think the one of the things that uh, uh, maybe uh, Niraj and I share, coming from the Bay Area, <laughs> is the uh, the highest construction costs in the world. I'm not proud to say that. I'm really annoyed that I have to say that, but um, uh, but that does have, start to have an impact on the architectural expression, and so I can start to see how um, you know we. I think ideally we would want to know that that there are you know, it'd be nice, it'd be comforting somehow to know that there are there are uh, regional um, uh, typologies that start to emerge from, um, you know, uh, a heightened sensitivity to the changing climate. In California, for example, you know, most of California relies, much of California relies on the Sierra Mountain snowpack, which is now predicted to go away in about 20 years. Um, so I think, you know, water, water is a big deal everywhere, and particularly in places like Texas. So I, I think, it, I think it is interesting to see how some of the, and I agree, I think some of the, some of the residential projects seem to share, you know, what, you know, maybe could be called a, a kind of an Austin, um, you know, version of, of rustic modernism. Um, um, but it, I think the ones that are most attractive are the ones that sort of seem to handle it really easily and again very honestly and with a sort of a forthright uh, uh, manner toward detailing and and uh, materiality um, mixed in with you know rainwater catchment and um, you know renewable energy and so forth i I think i I Cannot say much about living in Austin because I've only been there a couple of times. And I guess, um, as you say, the question is more of a, almost a worldwide one. And Austin is a great example because of its growth, but it's about thinking, how can we still live in the cities? How, what are the public instruments that are we trying to explore or have or achieve that can stop certain things that are happening or certain politics or some things being allowed um, that make it uh, impossible to stay in cities or make it uh, non-sustainable, per se, the least. And I remember walking in the street on East Austin just last month, and there was this series of what used to be old Mexican houses, the porch and one-level houses, and then right next to it, there was a, the foundation for a four-level parking which indicates that it would be a tower right next to this neighborhood of small houses. So that's just an example of, I asked, how can the city let this happen? How can we allowing this? And this is just one case and it can be applied for, I'm sure water strategies and what are we considering to be sustainable? Uh, how can we be sustainable to water our plants to, with um, potable water? How can that score on a lead card? And, I think that's some of the questions that we should ask ourselves from the small scale to, um, as I said, city strategies, political instruments, and um, yeah, or urban policies for cities and what programs are, are happening that can help us gather and discuss it and make strategies. Yeah, as, as Bill mentioned, you know, not only are we in a very expensive construction costs, uh, it's very expensive to live here. So I've lost a lot of good friends to Austin in the last five years. Uh, probably uh, everyone there is annoyed by the Californians that are coming in and <laughs> swooping Correct. up property. Correct, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, for me, it kind of, I was trying to think as, as I heard my colleagues answer, if you had just told me that I was on an AIA jury, but didn't tell me what city <laughs> I was jurying, would I know, you know, just from the submissions, if you know the the site plans or some of the narratives didn't reveal the context? And I don't know if I would. And and I, I wonder if that's a question of where Austin's at, you know, in terms of its land value. Because what we see here in San Francisco is the land value is so high that it it forces the multi-unit housing projects to be very self-similar because there's a kind of pressure to extract a certain level of value and actually just you know make the site somewhat profitable. And uh, you know, and, and then I was thinking, well, maybe the high end residential projects, they're free from that because they're operating in a different class altogether. Uh, but those were probably the most self similar of all of them. And, and there's this kind of very uh, pervasive 
I don't, I don't know what you call it. It's like an HGTV aesthetic that has, um, you know, gone through the discipline. And, um, and, you know, and I think that's also the other end of capitalism, right? That we kind of see in capitalism that things become more self-similar. And, um, and so, you know, one thing that I did, if I was trying to kind of go through all the submissions, definitely the, like the pavilions, the uh, public projects, these really were rooted in Austin, I found. And then many of the commercial and residential projects could almost be in many geographies with similar land value, I would say, or similar kind of economic uh, growth pressures on them. I think the one thing that I would pull out from particularly the, the housing projects, and I think Bill mentioned this already, is just an amazing level of craft and detailing, <laughs> like exquisite, exquisite craft and detailing. And maybe because construction costs are so high in the Bay, um, you know, at least I don't get the projects. <laughs> Bill might get projects like this. <laughs> I don't get the projects that, that we can do that level of craft and detailing on. <laughs> So Michelle, we just before you go, I know that all of them expected to show slides, but it seems like this conversation is very organic and I love it and I hope you do too. Maybe we forego the slides and keep talking a little bit longer and then get some questions from the audience. How, how do you all feel about that? We could also sort of have running of the slides in the background. Too, <laughs> or or well, we can attach the slides to the recording and let people see your slides and instead of because this is just fascinating and we would never get this is, is that all right with you <laughs> do, do, do we have some questions from from our guests other guests who are here questions anybody i have a question I thought that uh, I guess it was Niraj. Oh, let me speak to this. Um, Niraj spoke to it that maybe in five or ten years we'd start um, giving um, recognizing the team that actually made the work. Like that's a life onto itself. Um, I'm curious. Have you have you guys ever seen other chapters that might asked for that, maybe a little bit more than AIA Austin has. Um, is that, is anybody doing that yet? I know um, the ACSA, uh, which is um, geared more towards academics has awards for collaborative practice where um, it's really talking about how, like, cause I think there's two projects we're talking about that we're talking about changing the world <laughs> through our discipline and to do that, we realize we need to change the discipline itself and how it works, right? So there's kind of these two things. And, you know, and the reason I think it's going to take a while is because, you know, we need a whole generation of young academics to teach a young group of students and kind of free ourselves from, you know, years and years of bias, right? Um, and, and I think uh, the ACSA one is the only one that comes to mind where the Collaborative Practice Awards really speak to how a team is set up and how they're working with each other. So it's such a big part of some of these large projects is how that how relationships establish and how different voices come to the table and find uh, a form to negotiate in a productive way. Well, Al, surely you have a question. <laughs> no, I, actually, I'm sort of, I know you're not going to, um, don't need to show us your slides, but I would like to hear from each of you what you think the central focus of your own practice is or will be in the next year or two. Should, should we go ahead and, and if, do you think you could go through the five slides? fairly quickly, that might be a nice sort of like coda to all of this. We get a little little sense. Can you say it? Yeah. Sure, that might be helpful for everyone. Okay, yeah. Okay, do it. Yeah, so those first. And how do, how do we do this? They share their screen. Okay. Um, Was uh, it five slides? <laughs> 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 oh my God, okay. <laughs> if you don't have them. No, I have like 30. Stop thinking that she, she didn't have the last slide. I'm pretty sure. Raise your hand if it's less than 10. <laughs> okay. 
All right, Somebody will speak extra fast. Yeah? Bill, you want to go first? Sure. Um, let me see. I've got it teed up here. Mariana, you can be cutting down your slides. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see. Yep, we got it. You see that? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to do this really quickly. Um, so we're we're a firm of 35 people in San Francisco, and uh, you know I think this conversation we've had is is really uh, timely in the sense that we, um, uh, you know, really believe that architecture can help lead the way to a just, healthy, and regenerative future for all. Um, so we we focus exclusively on mission driven design. Uh, which uh, allows us to work with nonprofit affordable housing organizations, community groups, environmental foundations, and educational institutions to uh, advance their important missions through architecture. We've come to realize that architecture is essentially what we call a values proposition. It's really about sharing values with, um, with our clients uh, on behalf of the, of the broader community. Um, so, um, so I think at the end of the day, you know, we, we focus on really uh, these areas of, of, of climate action, um, social justice, um, uh, uh, housing for the homeless, um, and um, um, education and adaptive reuse. So those, those sort of five areas of, of interest are ones that um, are, are ones that I'm sort of steeped in. Um, and of course, you know, as I said, as we all know, um, uh, and I, I was going to mention this as well, that every every time the uh, the IPCC comes out with a report, I, I think you know anyone who's paying attention has to be chastened that uh, time is of the of the essence, and that we have really less than eight years to radically reduce global carbon emissions if um, if if society is going to avoid catastrophic climate destabilization. So. You know, we all have a, a really enormous responsibility, an enormous important role to play in 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 doing doing that. So this building is a, um, a, a, a innovation hub at UC UC Berkeley um, that uh, is a building that uses about ninety four percent less energy than a typical building of its size, almost to net zero. Um, social justice is a, is a huge issue, and we feel that, that architecture is fundamentally a social justice issue. Um, and uh, this is a project at, um, in Berkeley called the Ed Roberts Campus, which is a nonprofit uh, center for the independent living and disability rights movement. Um, it's, a, it's a project that uh, focuses on, on people with disabilities and, and houses nonprofits serving them. And, um, uh, it's one of the largest at the time. It was built about ten years ago. It's one of the largest uh, applications of um, universal design uh, integrated with sustainable design at a at a civic scale. Um, I mentioned I mentioned affordable housing. Large part of our practice is is uh, providing safe, healthy, and dignified housing, and and for for uh, for people in need, a variety of folks from. Um, uh, uh, unhoused individuals to low and very low income families, seniors at risk of homelessness, and uh, and veterans. This project is the Edward M. Lee Apartments, which is the first uh, building of its kind in San Francisco to combine supportive housing uh, for both unhoused veterans and low income families, um, and it brings them together in, in, a, in a in a in a building that that really promotes a I think a, a resilient uh, community. Um, yeah, in, the, in the Mission Bay neighborhood. Um, education is a huge deal. Um, uh, if now more than ever, I think we need education in the environments to support it, to um, provide, um, prepare, prepare informed, curious, and resilient global citizens who really know how to thrive in the, in the rapidly changing planet. So we're interested in designing schools uh, that are zero carbon living laboratories that help, that teach students how to become innovators um, for the future and uh, to shape a, a more intelligent, resilient world. This is the uh, Nueva School Hillside Learning Complex, which is a, um, a low, um, super low carbon um, uh, design that's, that's sort of immersed in the natural world and connects students every day to the world around them. Um, and as I mentioned, I think the reuse of existing buildings is essential to meeting our zero carbon goals and uh, 
and, and harvesting the, the, the embodied carbon and embodied culture uh, on behalf of uh, future generations. This project is a the adaptive reuse of a, of a former World War II Liberty ship pier uh, used by the Army in World War II. Uh, you can see a, an image up in the left-hand corner of what it used to be um, uh, during World War II and, uh, and what it is now a, 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 a building for the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, and uh, anyway, so we've essentially literally turned uh, um, swords to, uh, to artful plowshares in this case. And this building is a, a it represents about a 75% reduction in CO2 emissions uh, compared to a similar building of a new construction. So finally, um, you know, I think this this has always said it really best for me uh, that you know, uh, emphasizing the fact that architects have a unique role to play um, in 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 building a, a better future for for our communities, and and that. Uh, um, that this came out about uh, came out a couple of years ago now that the AA, uh, National AA Climate Action Plan and I, I loved I loved this this uh, this statement which I just think it sort of says it all you know that one one side countless challenges a looming deadline seven and a half billion clients this is the ultimate design project this is why we're here so that's my that's my thing thank you. Thank you, Bill. Who's next? Anyone? <laughs> Someone jump in? That's a tough presentation to follow. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll, I'll try to go next. Uh, <laughs> I feel like it's just going to get tougher <laughs> as we go on. Um, one second here. Okay, um, so I'll keep this super short. Uh, you know, the Open Workshop um, is a, we're a very young office um, based here in San Francisco, and uh, we're a design research practice, so uh, we do equal amounts of both. And we're really dedicated to um, empowering oppressed groups as well as the natural environment. And so our work takes on a variety of scales and is executed through a range of mediums from exhibitions to installations and buildings, as well as policy work. Um, so a core interest in the firm is the examination of collective form and the commons. Um, this is a solo exhibit we did at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco um, that reflected on different ways that design can bring together a collective body. And this really is important for us as we see this as the first step in addressing larger systemic issues such as climate change. Um, as mentioned, uh, these interests take a variety of forms, so books are a key part to the office. Um, on the left here is an edited volume um, that was done by myself and Mason White called Bracket Takes Action. This is a book series that we established about 10 years ago, and this latest issue looks at how design can um, catalyze sociopolitical action and on the right, uh, a recently published volume on the work of the office, uh, framing conversations around collectivity, form and equity in the built and natural environment. Um, we typically work in neighborhoods uh, with groups that have been neglected. Here in a recent project for the Chicago Architecture Biennial, we worked with local mutual aid and solidarity groups to create a newspaper directory uh, for them to kind of come together as a larger coalition, as well as a pavilion. And this is situated in the former elementary school in Bronzeville, which is on the south side of Chicago. And this really uh, creates a community living room, a space for gathering and learning. And it's really positioned as a malleable framework that utilizes a series of curtains uh, to create a range of room types from intimate to collective gatherings. And this fabric really acknowledges the evolving practices of commenting and perhaps most importantly in this project after the biennial uh, the project is still sitting there and has been stewarded forward by the community and for us this is the best use of uh, these kind of venues such as biennials is to provide something for the community. Um, we've also developed a, a body of work around collective living in particular we're interested in how people come together and form a shared set of politics and how space can support this. 
Um, these projects really embrace living together as a mechanism to create meaningful social units and support systems in the absence of the nuclear family, as well as providing residents more agencies on defining their own way of life. Um, so a, a very recent project, just an exhibition that opened last week in New York at the Center for Architecture, examined uh, networks of care for the elderly in West Oakland. And this project really addresses barriers, whether physical, social, financial, or cultural, that make it difficult to grow older with dignity and in community. And so this project, uh, which is called Aging Against the Machine, advocates for alternative housing and community development uh, scenarios for aging that open up multiple options for care, improve physical access to the city, enhance resource sharing, and strengthen community ties. Um, lastly, our research is often used to support policy changes. Through a case study analysis of a range of collective living projects, we created a large white paper report uh, to change the definition of group housing in San Francisco and to ensure that uh, group housing is not um, exploited by developers as a definition. And uh, this was recently enacted and signed by the, the mayor to redefine this uh, you know, idea of group housing of collective living to ensure minimum amounts of um, shared amenity space and the allocation of those amenity spaces. Um, so that was super quick. I don't have a beautiful slide of the world to wrap it up, uh, but just a, a very small teaser of some of the things that we're doing in the office. Wow, you had a video. <laughs> okay. I, that I was my cheat to keep the number of slides uh, <laughs> shorter. I'm going to follow your, your strategy on being next. I, I, I suspect Dominique will all blow us away with the last one. I'll try to be quick. Um, I, don't I, don't, I don't know if I presented uh, in the beginning, but I work at Tatiana Bilbao studio. It's a firm in Mexico City. And one of the, what we like, uh, what I like in the office is that we have an approach that also goes beyond architecture and we have the chance and the privilege sometimes to take some of our working hours to work on things that uh, are transcendent and are about humans and not really architecture. So for example, this is um, the Louisiana exhibition in Denmark, um, in Copenhagen. The Lu Louisiana Museum has this series of architect studios and we were invited to present our work. And many of this is uh, models from projects of the office and how they rela relate to context, which is I think one of the main um, goals and, and, and pillars, columns of the, I don't know how you say it metaphorically, of the work uh, at the office being very conscious about where we are doing projects, sustainability, trying to minimize footprint, trying to minimize how we touch them and, and change them. These are images of uh, some of the models that we try to respect topography and all of the topography that you're seeing here was actually the topography of the projects and how we showcase them as in such a gabinet of curiosities, um, again, referring to the particularity of each project, where it was personalization, not having projects that could be done anywhere else, but having some aspects that respond to a, a location, uh, some mock-ups of parts of projects, the aquarium, how, uh, park house, uh, Statera projects in Mexico, but also uh, worldwide, and I think this is just a, a very good sample of what the office uh, usually tries to explore and uh, attack. And as I was saying before, we, we do give time for, as an office, to think about what's happening during pandemic. We did um, workshops on how to change our spaces, how to adapt. Should we rethink work, house, and what's what's qualified and programmed as a workspace, as a living space, and really redirect things in, to open our horizons and re-question some things that we, some concepts of use, uses of spaces. And I think we did also a, a workshop on uh, discrimination after Black Lives Matter and really went back to our projects and, and, and went back like projects from years ago and look, where were we discriminating in our own architecture? What are you, we doing wrong? How, how are we qualifying and naming spaces and what should we change in the future? 
And just to show you some of some of the projects, this is us. <laughs> We're a big team in the center of Mexico City. But uh, if I can just go quickly through some projects, this is social housing in Acuna. This is the border in Mexico and United States. These were 16 houses after a tornado hit. These were very complicated because, uh, because of the weather conditions. It's extremely hot, uh, I guess, a bit hotter than Austin even. And <laughs> low budget for the housing. And you see the spaces are very tight and how to work on uh, square feet that now are the minimums are the new maximums. So how, how do we live to those standards and practice architecture? Uh, again, these are some images of the housing projects. Another one is the aquarium being built right now in Mazatlan, also in Mexico. How to approach such a big uh, project that we might have turned down if it was a uh, big volume, attacking on nature in front of a, a, a beach scenario, a river scenario, how to make it look like um, almost as part of nature and making it look, this tries to look like a ruin, like it was there, like it's, it's, containing, it's contained by nature rather than containing it. Uh, some images on how we explore the, the ecosystems, the Mar de Cortés, the approach of human versus nature some collages on interacting experiences rather than uh, framing the spaces, trying to understand what we wanted to feel when we were, we were there, we were walking through this nature. Some images of it being built, it's much more advanced than this. Now it's almost finished today. Uh, we use a lot of concrete. It's not so common in Austin, but um, it's kind of our local material here. Some images that try to go uh, and manifest that um, feeling, tectonics, um, exploring through collages, imagine, imagining realities. And last, uh, the Reconstruir Mexico was after the earthquakes, earthquake 2017, uh, biggest earthquake in 20 years in Mexico. Uh, this is from the state of Mexico. A lot of families got a kind of a sponsorship from the government. And for the first time they had uh, technique and someone advising them on how to build their own houses. This was, many of them were uh, self-built. And so these, all these houses were made with very humble materials and they were made with the person that was going to inhabit them, conversations on the family, how they wanted the house, how could they build the house? We basically gave them the expertise so that they executed it and this is another house completely different. So we didn't go for a prototype. We rather gave people the tools to try to imagine their own house uh, with the budget they had. Um, these are very humble neighborhoods. And I think this is my last slide. Uh, I don't have an ending also. <laughs> This is all incredibly impressive here. I'm gonna see if I can um, just, I'll be very, very quick. Um, let's see. This has been totally worth. Yeah, it's been I know, I'm doing so this. glad to share oh. your slides. They're amazing. Okay, Plus we so. all got some more wine. You know, just, just oh, good. <laughs> Can you can you see my screen here? Yes. Okay. Um, so we've spent the last you know fifteen years or so trying to really define what it is that we do and are passionate about, and um, about you know five years ago or so we started to distill it into this idea of positive impact design, and uh, it looks like my slides got a little messed up here, uh, but. And those um, that is defined by these five factors: so cultural and economic, um, aesthetic factors, uh, resource impact, how we approach the client and the community with uh, an eye towards you know empathy and acting boldly on their behalf, and then the spatial impact, um, you know, at the street. Um, 
it as a kind of urban design idea um, in Linton. Recently, we've expanded that now. So we have two landscape architects on staff as well. Um, so just a kind of a, a, while, a wide array of project types that we do. Um, but there's always um, all of these aspects or most of these aspects embedded in, in each one. And that's how we decide if we take a project on is, is it going to um, challenge us in, in these five ways. So um, one project um, that was kind of a, a breakout project for us this, uh, a few years back um, was looking at a city block of Kansas City um, along an area that had typically been a, a, a red line, dividing line uh, in the city and there hadn't been any new development um, in 50 years. And so we looked at how do we um, do a affordable and market rate uh, residential project there, multifamily project in a way that was really going to um, engage the community. And so we decided to plan the entire city block around um, pedestrian pathways and, and connections from different sides of the neighborhood and north, south, east, west um, through the blocks and um, kind of um, reorganize the, the plan um, from what you would typically see um, based on those pedestrian pathways. And so um, that's um, something that we were pleased then in terms of the feedback we got from the surrounding community and folks that had been living there for decades. Um, whoops, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, that they really welcomed it and were excited um, to see how it came together because that was, we were really concerned about, um, you know, gentrification and, and displacement um, for the project. Um, another um, project that we're working on right now is, uh, it's one of the bigger ones for us for sure, um, is the KCI airport terminal. So we're teamed here with SOM, um, a, a large part of what we do is collaborative work with other firms, whether national or other uh, local firms, because we're we're a, a firm of 16 people. And so, um, and given the wide interest in project types that we have, um, we like to kind of go arm in arm with other firms and, um, and venture out into different project types. And so this has been a phenomenal one where we've really been able to um, focus on the sustainable aspects of the project. It'll be lead gold um, and also uh, get into researching local materials, working with local fabricators, um, such as on the stone walls and the, um, the flooring um, details and things like that. So um, that's uh, something that we're actively in the process of constructing and should be complete in about a year. Um, Another project um, that uh, embodies the kind of adaptive reuse part of our practice is this messenger coffee project. It's a historic register um, building that we um, did a complete redo of, um, also uh, teamed with a, a firm out of San Francisco that you all probably know, um, uh, Boar Bridges and um, did uh, um, a complete revamp of the, the interior and then added a roof deck on it onto it. Um, so tying all four levels of the historic building, the basement, the main floor, second floor, and then that roof um, together through this vertical um, circulation. Uh, and uh, it's been a, a really successful um, endeavor for the for the firm and we continue to work and collaborate with them on on other locations um, throughout the city and then last one I just wanted to touch on quickly I'm just trying to show a smattering of the kind of variety of work that we do so um, this Blue Springs master plan um, we're master planning a, a development of about 240 townhomes 
um, that is going to be a, a, a very different type of development than we've seen in in the surrounding um, area of Kansas City previously. Uh, low impact style development, um, is a smart technology, um, net zero ready um, development. So each of these um, homes is oriented for um, optimizing for solar panels, um, gray water systems and um, low, you know, low flow, uh, of course. Um, so we're, we're really focused on the, the water um, efficiency aspect of this. And again, orienting um, the buildings um, towards uh, being heavily pedestrian focused. So we really kind of brought all of the, um, the residential buildings into uh, a tighter radius and uh, were able to leave um, the majority of the site um, open for um, the surrounding woodlands and trails and things like that to continue to exist as they were. So um, that's kind of what I've got. But yeah, I'm very, very impressed with the work of, of the other jurors. It's really, really exciting to see. So thank you for sharing. Thank you so much to all of you. Wow, I can't wait to talk to you tomorrow. It's gonna be fun. This has been really amazing. Thank you, Michelle. I love, I, I love this. This makes me so happy. And thanks everyone for coming tonight. This is so great. Thank you, Gensler, for having us. Thank you, Gerardo, Honorada. Um, I guess, jurors, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bright and early. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thanks Thank you. for having us. Bye. 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 It was down to 11%.